Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you for being here with us today. Uh, welcome to the uh, Congressional Western Caucus Species Week. Uh, it's a forum. That we're, we're, we're titling a Roadmap for Recovery. So we're very delighted that you're here to join us in this very important discussion. And I've just got a, a little bit of an opening comments before we get into your presentations. Uh, and you probably have been told this already, but there's a, a million different things happening today. We're anticipating members are gonna be coming in and out uh, for different segments of this. But rest assured, this is all being uh, taped and recorded and uh, we'll be listening intently to everything you have to offer. So I want, to, want you to know that. Uh, this is our second annual Species Week, uh, which um, that sounds like it's kind of a, a fun thing to say, that it's a lighthearted topic, but as you know, these are crucial issues that are important to rural, rural communities across the country. Um, so I'm, I don't want to downplay the importance of it at all. Um, I'm de delighted that my fellow Western Caucus, Caucus members are joining me and highlighting why it's so critical for us to uh, improve and, and really modernize the endangered, the endangered Species Act, which went into effect when I was a junior in high school. And I'll just let you figure out how long that's been. <laughs> uh, we're doing so by outlining our solutions to return the ESA's uh, ESA back to its original congressional intent, which is effective and successful species recovery, which is a very admirable, admirable goal. And today I'm, I'm very proud to welcome a panel of experts who understand that the ESA is outdated and isn't working in a lot of cases, as well as the fact that there are reforms that we can pass here in Congress to modernize this landmark legislation. Some may point to the fact that the ESA has kept many species from extinction, and that, that truly is something to be proud of and commend. But I think we can also agree that looking at the dynamic, uh, that is kind of looking at it through what one could say rose-colored glasses. Only 3% of species that ha have been removed from the endangered species list, and that's in almost 50 years. 3%. And by anybody's standards, by anybody's way of measuring, that to me uh, seems to be a fairly dismal record. Instead of focusing on recovery, this landmark species protection law has been turned into a weapon in many cases, used against rural communities to stop energy development, agricultural production, lots of forms of progress. Instead of celebrating the successful recovery of a species, like the gray wolf or, say, the grizzly bear, many bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. and activist judges are actively working to keep species listed under the ESA permanently. And that's really a shame because there are some truly innovative, effective species recovery efforts happening throughout the United States without a mandate from the federal government. Um, what Western Caucus members understand, what we're urging our colleagues in Congress and the administration to recognize is that states and local conservations, those who are closest to the habitats and the ecosystems, are best suited to protect endangered and threatened species. In rural America today, if a, if a landowner finds an endangered species on their land, you'd think that would be reason to be uh, to celebrate, but it's quite the opposite. They're actually terrified with that discovery. And I'm a farmer from the central part of the state of Washington, and I've, I've seen firsthand how the ESA listings can destroy whole industries, whole communities, local economies, and not just in one small area, but in an entire state. That, simply should not be the case. We know that by reducing federal roadblocks and encouraging effective management efforts at the local level, we can truly achieve our recovery goals and ensure that rural communities thrive. It shouldn't be an either or proposition. As I, as I mentioned, throughout Species Week, we are working to promote our solutions to do 
exactly that. Our solutions are based on three pillars, transparency, flexibility, and scientific credibility. These pillars are our roadmap to species recovery. By increasing transparency around ESA listing decisions, we can ensure these decisions are sound and better and understand the impacts the listing will have on local communities. Instead of punishing communities for being home to endangered or threatened wildlife, we should incentivize them to care for and to protect them. By providing flexibility for the on-the-ground species manage managers, we can support effective recovery efforts that actually work. And lastly, this, and this should be what you would call common sense, a rare, rare commodity, these listing decisions must be rooted in science. ESA listings have an enormous impact on, in, on, on many communities and they deserve to know that they were based on the best available science and not motivated by a misguided political agenda. So I look forward to hearing from our panelists today. Again, thank you very much for being here, as well um, as many of my fellow members of the Western Caucus who will share more about the solutions we need to bring about this well-intentioned law into the 21st century. And I see two more of my esteemed colleagues have joined me, Ms. Miller Meeks from Iowa, thank you very much for being here, and Ms. Bobert from the state of Colorado, thanks for joining. So with, with that, Again, I want to thank every one of my panelists for being here today and attending our first in-person forum. Uh, appreciate you all making the, the journey to be with us in Washington, D.C. I will introduce each of you for your opening remarks and then we'll go into our uh, question and answer period with the members as they come in and out. Um, and as I said, with this being the last week before our traditional August recess, there are a lot of activities happening, a lot of committee meetings, some important briefings that are going on right now. So um, just understand that members will be coming in and out, but like, like I said, rest assured, we will all be listening very, very carefully to what you're saying. So first of all, I'd be delighted to introduce Mr. Jonathan Wood. Mr. Wood is the Vice President of Law and Policy at the Property and Environment Research Center, um, affectionately known as PERC, located in Bozeman, Montana. Prior to working at PERC, Jonathan was a senior attorney at the Pacific, Pacific Legal Foundation where he litigated cases concerning the Endangered Species Act, uh, also the Clean Water Act, and other federal environmental laws. So, Mr. Wood, you've got um, five minutes for your remarks. Thank you, Chairman Newhouse and members of the Congressional Western Caucus for hosting this important and timely discussion of the Endangered Species Act. Next year, the law will turn 50, making this a really good time to reflect on what the act has done well and where it's fallen short. And I'm glad, Chairman Newhouse, that you started by acknowledging that the ESA does seem to be working for preventing extinction. That 99% of the species that have been listed are still around today, and that's something we should celebrate. Uh, but we should also be very mindful and not lose sight of the fact that only 3% of species have recovered. And the reason for that mismatch ultimately comes down to incentives. The ESA and the way it's been implemented have been about stopping activities that harm species and not about motivating habitat restoration or the other proactive conservation activities necessary to recover species. So if we want to boost boost the recovery rate for species, we want to avoid the conflicts that have dominated the ESA discussion for five decades, we need to get those incentives right and reward landowners and industry and others for doing the on-the-ground work that keeps species around and will ultimately recover them so that they no longer need the ESA's protections. However, we also have to be sensitive to the fact that people are concerned about reforms to the ESA, that the fact that it is succeeding in avoiding extinctions gives people cause for for fear that we'll lose that effectiveness if we get changes. And that's why it's really important that reforms focus on boosting incentives for recovering species without undermining the things that have been successful of keeping species off the precipice of extinction. Um, I'm reminded of a statement by former Fish and Wildlife Service uh, Director Sam Hamilton, who explained the pro fundamental problem with the ESA is that, quote, the incentives are wrong here. If a rare metal is on my property, the value of the land goes up. But if a rare bird occupies the land, its value disappears. That is a fundamental problem. If we value species, 
and the species have to be an asset to the landowners who provide habitat and do all the other important day-to-day -day work to ensure that those species remain around. In my written statement, I discuss five reforms to put more species on the road to recovery without sacrificing DSA's success at avoiding extinctions. These include prioritized recovery planning, fundamentally rethinking how threatened species are regulated, an incentive-based approach to designating critical habitat, reviving the ESA's federalism provision. Most people don't realize that, like every other federal sta environmental statute, states are supposed to play a really important role, but due to the way a lot of been implemented, we've lost that. Um, and finally, making it easy, easier to promptly delist, delist species when they recover and rewarding the successful recovery efforts. Uh, but in the interest of time and in the recognition of the title for this forum, I want to focus on just that second proposal, uh, the idea of changing the way we think about and regulate threatened species. And I propose that we need to think beyond simply codifying the approach that the Trump administration adopted in 2019 of restoring the act's original approach where endangered species are regulated more strictly than threatened species. That is a good approach, and Perks research supports and shows that that approach makes sense for incentivizing recovery. If landowners receive regulatory relief when they put in the effort to recover species from endangered or threatened, they're more likely to make those investments. But we can actually do better. And we can, re we can think more creatively about how threatened species are treated and regulated to provide even stronger incentives. What PERC has proposed in conversations with the administration and others is that we think about threatened species as opportunities to develop roadmaps to recovering species. What those roadmaps will look like will differ depending on the species, but every species has some goal you're trying to reach in order to de-list it, whether that's conserving a certain amount of habitat or increasing the population to a certain point that is no longer at risk of extinction. And in designing rules for threatened species, the Fish and Wildlife Service should be identifying the interim steps between where the species is now and where it will be fully recovered and off the list, and providing clear objective benchmarks for states and landowners to achieve and rewarding success in meeting those. So we, we mentioned the grizzly earlier. In an ideal world, when the grizzly was listed as threatened, Fish and Wildlife Service would have said, this is the number we're trying to reach for it to be fully recovered, um, and here are the five steps between where we are now and where we're going. And every time a state a landowner meets that goal, we're gonna reduce federal regulation. So that over time, states take leadership in managing that species. And today, you wouldn't have the same conflict over the listing because states would have already been showing that they were up to manage the species. Um, I said earlier, what that actually looks like will depend. Sometimes it'll be benchmarks for the population. So if you wanna get to 10,000, you reward states and landowners at 2,000, 4,000, 6,000. Sometimes it'll be habitat. But by creating clear incremental benchmarks that people can target, you're more likely to get investments in recovery actions, especially if you reward them. Um, and this, that, that, that really is key. That landowners have to know that if I recover a species, the regulatory burdens on me are gonna lighten. Fortunately, that hasn't been the status quo, but that really is the key to putting species on the road to recovery. Anybody here in the audience for that? Okay, very good. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Appreciate that. Look forward to some questions for you later. Uh, next, oh, thank you, David. Um, appreciate that, Mr. Wood. Next, uh, we have Commissioner Jim French from the Humboldt, Humboldt County of the great state of Nevada. Commissioner French spent his career as a state wildlife biologist in Nevada, so he understands very well how important state and locally led species recovery efforts are, are and how they should be. So, Commissioner French, welcome. Thank you for being with us. And, Floor is yours. Well, thank you, Chairman Davis and Chairman Newhouse, uh, and members of the Western Caucus. Uh, counties appreciate the opportunity to address Endangered Species Act ESA and how to improve partnerships that can lead to better outcomes for the species and the environment and the communities. <clears throat> As you say, uh, stated, my name is Jim French. I'm a commissioner from Humboldt County, Nevada, and I also serve on the National Association of Counties Public Land Steering Committee and Western Interstate Region Board of Directors. I'm here today on behalf of the National Association of Counties. Before serving in public office, I helped write and develop species recovery plans as a professional wildlife biologist for the state of Nevada. I have spent my career studying and working to conserve threatened and endangered species. Counties understand the value of protecting threatened and endangered species. Unfortunately, in my experience, the ESA is abused by organizations focused on lucrative litigation instead of species recovery. Additionally, the ESA tends to lead to permanent listings, oftentimes even after population recovery goals are met. According to the Congressional Research Service, uh, of the approximate 2,400 species listed under ESA, 91 have been delisted, delisted. 
This is minuscule uh, success rate and points to why the ESA needs to be updated. County government can play an important role in effective wildlife management and in improving outcomes of ESA. We tend to view ESA through the lens of federal and state relationships since state game and fish agencies are charged and trusted with the, the most hands-on wildlife management efforts. However, federal agencies also have an obligation to consult with counties under ESA. Section 1533B of the ESA mentions counties as necessary partners in the listing process. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service must take into account the conservation efforts of states and their political subdivisions when making listing decisions. Counties believe the ESA can improve the, uh, to strengthen uh, the relationships between federal agencies, states, and local off, uh, officials. Federal agencies should coordinate fully with impacted state and local governments when making decisions surrounding species listings, designating critical habitat, and planning and managing for species recovery and delisting. Counties bring a broader view to the table on ESA. Federal agencies, private stakeholders, and NGOs can be hindered by the narrow focus of their mission or advocacy priorities. However, counties must consider the health and welfare of the entire county, its people, land, water, and wildlife. Counties throughout the country develop natural resource plans and baseline socioeconomic data, which can provide critical scientific and economic data and information on local customs and cultures. Counties also serve as partners in candidate conservation agreements and assurances and other in intergovernmental partnerships designed to improve outcomes for species while ensuring regulatory consistency for impacted industries and surrounding communities. ESA listings in Humboldt County date back into the 1970s and have often uh, created issues with state and local operations, tourism, and local economic base. Recently, the proposed listing of the Greater Sage Grouse in much of the Great Basin has garnered significant attention and generated consternation in our county and the entire West. Interim management guidelines included um, seasonal closures of more than 10 million acres of public lands. These closures combined with newly implemented regulations limited county fire management actions, search and rescue operations, public safety communication access, and other traditional uses of surrounding public lands, including hunting, fishing, and ecotourism. Industries comprising more than 80% of the regional economic tax base were limited or excluded from uh, project expansion. Many of these real negative impacts on our community could have been mitigated if cooperative engagement had been initiated on the onset. By contrast, the threatened listing of the Lahontan Cutthroat Trout, LCT, in 1975 involved an extensive effort to identify opportunities for effective management of species and critical habitats under ESA. Input from state agency managers combined with data from local government master plans provided a trajectory to effectively manage LCT populations. At the same time, grazers, mining interests, and outdoor enthusiasts rallied around this effort. Presently, this cooperative approach to ESA listing for the LCT population growth and a, and a real prospect for delisting of the LCT in the future. In Humboldt County, the contrast between these two efforts could not be more stark. Federal agencies will gain more uh, from cooperated effort with, within county governments, allowing the greater local input, engaging in efforts to understand the customs and cultures of local economy, economies and communities, and un undertaking an honest assessment of socioeconomic impacts of the ESA is not a threat to species viability. The best conservation decisions are made by local people working collaboratively with state and federal agency personnel at the ground level. And once again, I thank you for the opportunity to be here, and, uh, and I look forward to further, any further questions. Great. Thank you very much, Commissioner French. Uh, next, I'm going to turn to, uh, I'd like to introduce Mr. Gary Weens. He's the uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Montana Electric Cooperative Association, an organization he's led, I believe, since 2019. And I understand, uh, Mr. Weens, that you're a former congressional staffer, so I apologize for outing you about that. Oh, no, no. But, uh, 
And you must know your way around the Rayburn building a little better than the Rayburn. Rayburn, that's where I was at, yeah. Okay, very good. The floor is yours, you've got five minutes. Chairman Newhouse and members of the Western Caucus, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. And thank you for your efforts to reform, improve the Endangered Species Act. The ESA should not be applied in a one-size-fits-all manner because such a broad federal implementation standard just does not work. To be effective, ESA must engage private stakeholders and state and local governments, focus on species recovery, be based on impartial scientific standards and best available information, and have to balance those species interests with essential economic activity. As you said, my name is Gary Weins. I'm here on behalf of the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association, commonly known as NRECA, as well as the Montana Electric Co-ops Association, or MECA, where I serve as the CEO, as you mentioned. NRECA is the National Trade Association for nearly 900 rural electric co-ops responsible for keeping the lights on for more than 42 million people across America. MECA is a not-for-profit statewide trade association primarily representing 25 consumer electric distribution cooperatives. We serve about 40% of the state's population. Each co-op is, of course, uh, customer-owned, locally controlled, and not-for-profit. Electric co-ops prioritize efforts to be good stewards of the environment. After all, electric co-op employees, they don't just work in their communities, but that's where they live. ESA's track record of a recovery of around 3% has shown that a one-size-fits-all federal standard across the nation doesn't work to recover species. Instead, it, it leaves them in a state of regulatory purgatory. So that's why we believe a more practical approach is necessary. And so I want to highlight a few examples of co-ops and states working to protect species while providing reliable and affordable power to one in eight Americans. So the Pacific Northwest, it's home to some of the nation's largest hydropower generation, as the chairman well knows. Every year, it, um, pro projects like the Lower Snake River dams help provide carbon-free power to 60% of the people in the Pacific Northwest, creating 90% of the renewable energy in the region. Ongoing calls to remove the Lower Snake River dams to benefit fish ignore the facts. These dams feature highly advanced and successful passage systems. And dams are on track to achieve standards of 96% average dam survival for young spring chinook and steelhead migrating downstream and 93% for young summer migrating fish. And affordable power produced by federal dams is essential to economic stability of local communities. Montana is no exception. Our co-ops serve in many of the state's high poverty counties. This includes most of the state's Indian reservations. One of these is the Blackfeet Reservation in Glacier County. The Blackfeet depend on federal hydropower for affordable electricity. A staggering 31% of Glacier County's residents live below the poverty line, according to a report issued at the end of last year. And regarding sage grouse, my home state of Montana has taken an active role in their protection. In 2015, Montana adopted the Montana Sage Grouse Conservation Strategy. This strategy acts in partnership with state agencies, local governments, and landowners. Our state association was active in and remains active in developing and implementing this program. For example, our association led efforts to minimize impacts on the sage grouse by reasonably incentivizing the burial of utility power and telecommunications line, lines. Montana's approach is working on this. In 2014, the year before Montana adopted its sage grouse strategy, the estimated population of greater sage grouse in the state was 32,407. In 2021, our most recent available numbers indicate that the estimated sage grouse population was 70,583. Of course, challenges remain, but doubling the number of greater sage grouse in less than a decade is no small undertaking is made possible because of state and local engagement. Federal land managers can learn from co-ops and our state partners. Stakeholder involvement with government works. Montana's electric co-ops were the first electric utilities in the nation to de voluntarily develop a joint comprehensive avian protection plan assembled and implemented in cooperation with federal and state wildlife management agencies. Stakeholder involvement with government also works regionally. For example, our co-ops are active on the very effective Missouri River Implementation Committee, which is a stakeholder process that is protecting this pallid sturgeon and other listed species. So 
We urge Congress to reauthorize the ESA and they can improve it by focus on species recovery, increase transparency in how that act is implemented, utilize data that is thorough, balanced, and based on scientific standards and impartial peer review, and then prioritize proactive stakeholder collaboration and state and local government engagement. Electric co-ops stand ready to assist the caucus and others in Congress as you work to improve the ESA. Thank you again for the opportunity to appear before you. Great, thank you, Mr. Reeds. And we'll have questions for you as well. Um, next, I'd like to turn to Mr. Darren Bath, Bast. I could say that when I first met you, but I can't say Bast. A, uh, he's a senior research fellow for environmental policy and regulation at the Heritage Foundation. Darren has got a long history of working with regulatory reform and environmental policy, including a stint with the United States Chamber of Commerce. So Mr. Bax, uh, welcome, and I'll turn the floor over to you for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Newhouse and members of the Congressional Western Caucus, thank you again for the invitation to testify about species recovery. As stated, my name is Darren Bax, and I'm a Senior Research Fellow in Environmental Policy and Regulation at the Heritage Foundation. The views I express are my own and shouldn't be um, considered as representing any position of the Heritage Foundation. In terms of species recovery, the ESA has been a failure with less than 3% of listed species being delisted due to recovery. That's unacceptable and it needs to change. Today's form is precisely the type of proactive action needed to help make an important difference for the ESA. There are some who will criticize anyone who dares to touch the ESA. Such criticism for seeking to modernize and improve the statutes doing a disservice to recovery efforts. The goal, after all, is species recovery, not preservation of every word and every comma of the statute. Before getting into some specific solutions, I'd like to discuss some, an overarching problem. If we as society seek to conserve species, then society itself should bear the cost of doing so. These costs shouldn't be unfairly borne by private property owners. Yet that's exactly what's happening. Designation of land as critical habitat has shown to reduce land values by as much as 73%. This understandably creates a major disincentive for property owners to help with species conservation. Further, the severe land use restrictions that can be imposed under Section 9 take restrictions are yet another penalty on property owners. And this is a big deal for species conservation, given the critical role that private property owners can play in achieving the ESA's objectives. In fact, about half of the list of species have at least 80% of their habitat on private land. So now I'd like to turn to four specific solutions. The first two statutory solutions I'm going to identify don't fix a problem with the statute itself, but fix a problem with its implementation. So first, clarifying statute that threatened species and endangered species are to be treated differently regarding take prohibitions. Based on the express language and statute, the take prohibition does not apply the threatened species unless by special rule. The Fish and Wildlife Service has reversed this historically by creating a default position where the take prohibition does apply to the threatened species unless by special rule. In doing so, it has removed an important incentive of property owners, which would be to try and avoid harsh take prohibitions by trying to ensure a threatened species doesn't become an endangered species. Second, clarify a statute that economic analyses should be included with listing decisions. ESA merely states that listing determinations be based solely on the basis of the best scientific and commercial data available after conducting a review of the status of the species. This doesn't say that the agencies may not mention any reference to economic or other impacts. This type of information should be provided to, provide to promote transparency, which is one of the pillars, and for achieving better outcomes to conserve species. When policymakers know what the actual costs and benefits are for conserving species, they can better understand the ESA and how existing law might be improved to meet policy goals. There's nothing new in conducting economic analysis when an agency is prohibited from using that analysis to make an inform, to actually make the decision. This is exactly what the EPA does when it comes to national ambient air quality standards. Third, decouple listing decisions from all other aspects of the ESA. When a species is listed, it triggers many requirements, starting with critical habitat designations. The listing decision shouldn't have any policy meaning unto itself. It should be a scientific decision without policy repercussions. 
By keeping the listing separate from the policy repercussions, this should improve transparency and reduce the conflating of science and policy. This will also help to improve policy choices made. There should be careful analysis for each species, properly recognizing the full impact, including practical repercussions and unintended consequences of moving forward with federal regulatory efforts. And fourth, adjust the focus of analyses and the considerations made. Agencies should be expected to make the likelihood of success of recovery efforts a primary consideration. This is like a triage approach. There's limited time and resources, and those limited time resources should be focused where successful outcomes are more likely. There should be a detailed review of whether alternatives exist that can reasonably achieve the same outcomes after federal regulatory intervention, such as existing private action or state or regional programs. In fact, the default should be state, regional, or private action can achieve the desired outcomes. Finally, the cost of property owners, including reductions of property values and the cost of foregone projects, should be required to be quantified for any proposed actions. I want to commend the caucus for holding today's forum and for all its important work. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify. Thank you very much, Darren. And now I'd like to turn for our last panelist, um, uh, a fellow farmer. This one, Mr. Alan Meadows, who comes from to us from Hills, Tennessee, I understand, or Halls, Tennessee. Halls, yes, me. sir. You currently serve on the board of directors for the American Soybean Association, and uh, Alan previously served as the Tennessee Soybean Association president. Uh, his farm averages, I'm told, 2,300 acres of soybeans, also corn and wheat. And all I can say, that sounds like a lot of beans. <laughs> Alan, uh, welcome, and appreciate you being here. Uh, Turn the floor over to you for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I would uh, like to thank Chairman Newhouse and the uh, Congressional Western Caucus for the opportunity to join today's panel. Uh, as you said, my name is Alan Meadows. I'm a soybean, corn, and wheat farmer uh, from Halls, Tennessee. I'm here today representing the American Soybean Association. Uh, ASA is a national trade association that represents 500,000 soybean farmers across 30 soybean producing states on domestic and international policy issues. Uh, the Endangered Species Act is a very important policy uh, issue to U.S. soybean growers. While farmers face ESA challenges on several fronts, my comments today will focus on a more dire area uh, where ESA intersects ag policy, and that's access to pesticides. First, let me explain why farmers need pesticides. Uh, in agriculture, we face many pests, inse insects, weeds, molds, uh, which often enjoy uh, eating our foods as much as we do. Uh, many of these pests are well documented to reduce crop yields by up to 50% or even more if left unchecked. Uh, at a time when global food security is threatened, farmers need tools uh, to protect our crops more than ever. Additionally, growers use pesticides to enable important conservation practices like cover crops and no-till, uh, which would be very hard to maintain without these tools. For example, herbicides give farmers an alternative to intensive soil tillage to manage weeds or to terminate cover crops prior to planting a primary crop. These practices sequester soil carbon, reduce erosion, minimize nutrient losses to watersheds. If growers lose access to these tools, these environmental benefits will also suffer. Pesticides are also very well regulated. EPA thoroughly examines pesticides to ensure they do not pose an unreasonable risk to human health or the environment. However, EPA has not historically conducted ESA consultations on pesticide registration. This has led to a series of court challenges and registration vacatures. It has resulted in growers losing access to pesticides at very inopportune times. In response to these challenges, EPA is, a, is identifying ways to make its pesticide program ESA compliant, but it is not easy. Uh, Congress designed ESA to examine whether a project, a bridge, or a building would impact species local to that project. It was not designed to examine if a pesticide regis registered for dozens of crops used across hundreds of millions of acres might impact nearly all 1,800 endangered or threatened species overlapping with its use. Uh, this is our, our gargantuan task. Uh, federal regulators do not have the resources to tackle. As a result, EPA and other regulators are conducting pilot projects to determine if there are efficiencies that can be made to the regulatory processes. 
While ASA supports the pesticide program becoming ESA compliant, we are very anxious of what this could also mean for grower access to these much needed tools. Uh, for example, back in January, EPA announced the re-registration of a common 2,4-D herbicide with new ESA restrictions. In the new registration, hundreds of counties were outright banned from using the herbicide due to potential endangered species impact. Many farmers had already taken the delivery of, of the herbicide and uh, to the herbicide tolerant seed ahead of spring planting uh, that they were told then that they could no longer use. Thankfully, uh, after an outcry from the grower community, EPA largely fixed the registration, but we worry that this is only a sign of things to come. EPA has since proposed new ESA restrictions on other common herbicides, uh, atrazine, that are also likely to be unworkable for most growers. To be clear, farmers want to be good environmental stewards and we want to protect species, but we need protections to be flexible, workable for agriculture, and stem from good science and data. Our food security and environmental conservation depend on it. ASA and other grower organizations have ideas to improve ESA pesticide processes, which we are eager to work with uh, pol policymakers uh, on that. Uh, for example, EPA's current ESA analysis are extremely conservative and often do not incorporate real world usage data or existing conservation practices growers already use that benefit species. In a recent ESA analysis on the herbicide glyphosate, EPA assumed that growers used the label maximum rates, which are four to six times the amount soybean growers actually use. This results in vastly, vastly inflated species impact assessments, which increase regulatory workloads and may result in restrictions that could be found unnecessary if better data was used. Also, for many species, range maps are used that cover entire counties or states, when in reality a species may be in a fraction of that area and nowhere near agriculture. To arbitrarily restrict pesticides on ESA grounds for entire counties, which in the West can be the size of small states, <laughs> makes no sense. ASA and the grower community have other ideas how it can be improved as a win-win for agriculture and for species. We appreciate today's dialogue and look forward to further discussions. Thank you for the opportunity of being here. Great, thank you very much, Mr. Meadows. And thank all of the panelists for being here and adding to this important discussion. I uh, appreciate you taking the time today, and, and from what you've said, I think you've done a great job of helping demonstrate why, why state and local managers need more say, more influence in making these decisions as it relates to recovery of, of species, and endangered species, and threatened species. So, I know we've got several members here, like I promised, they're going to be coming in and out. Um, I'd like to get to some of the questions that I know that they've got. I'm going to first turn to... Um, the young lady from the great state of Colorado, Ms. Bobert, you've got uh, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Weiss, I, I love the statement that you made of regulatory purgatory. Uh, you know, that, that is um, absolutely um, spot on. That's, that's what we see in so many uh, of these alphabet suit agencies that tend to um, regulate our communities into poverty and just restrict them. Um, so, so thank you for that. Maybe that's a commonly used term, but that's the first time that I had heard it and uh, probably use it a, a, a lot after this. Um, but it's clear that the Democrat Party and their radical green enablers um, won't allow real science to get in the way of their destructive policies that we see. Uh, the written purpose of the Endangered Species Act is to recover species to the point that they are no longer considered endangered or threatened. The gray wolf is currently found in more than 50 countries around the world and has been classified as an animal of least concern globally for risk of extinction. This designation makes clear that this species is not endangered nor threatened with extinction. An estimated 7,000 to 1,100 uh, uh, 11,200 gray wolves live in Alaska and another 60,000 in Canada. There are more than 5,000 gray wolves in the lower 48 states. In 2013 and in 2019, in, a, uh, in light of a clear scientific foundation, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service published a proposed rule that they would remove the gray wolf from the list of endangered and threatened wildlife range-wide throughout the 48 uh, um, states in both instances 
This determination was made after the service reviewed the best available scientific information and found that the species was actually thriving. The gray wolf population has exceeded their population growth rate by 300%. State governments are fully qualified to manage gray wolf populations and are better able to meet the needs of local communities, ranchers, livestock, and the wildlife populations. Delisting the gray wolf under the ESA will allow statewide, uh, excuse me, state wildlife officials to more effectively manage wolf populations. There's no reason to continue listing the gray wolf except for the Democrat Party's never ending war to lock up more and more of our lands. I introduced an amendment to the recent appropriations bill to delist the gray wolf. I've also introduced HR 7766 the Trust the Science Act that would delist the gray wolf as an endangered species. Even so, common sense efforts to reform the ESA, like the ones my colleagues and I have proposed, have fallen on deaf ears. FWS is now initiating a process to reintroduce the gray wolf back in Colorado, uh, jeopardizing the welfare of ranchers and livestock throughout my home state. The gray wolf isn't the only example of this regime weaponizing the Endangered Species Act to lock up more land. In the case of the Gunnison sage grouse, the Bureau of Land Management, who has refused to ease the pressure of high gas prices for ordinary Americans, is now looking to amend nearly a dozen management plans to impose major land use restrictions across 7.6 million acres of federal lands in Colorado under the guise of needing further protections for the Gunnison sage grouse. At a time of record high gas prices, the Biden regime is primarily seeking to amend these plans in order to block oil and gas in production. Could this regime be more out of touch? Americans need relief at the pump. Gunnison County, Colorado, which is in my district, contains about 85% of all Gunnison sage grouse. And I wanna be clear in saying that my constituents, Republican and Democrat, have done everything under the sun to work with the state and, and federal authorities to continue to protect the Gunnison sage grouse and the greater sage grouse, for that matter, while pushing back against the uh, expansive definitions of critical habitat and foreseeable in, in, in the foreseeable future. To be clear, my constituents in Gunnison County remain ready and willing to work with the Biden regime on this. Colorado stakeholders have um, invested at least $150 million to increase populations of the greater sage grouse, and no federal efforts has yet to match this commitment. In fact, the number of Gunnison sage grouse on the range and investments to, the conserv to conserve the species have both significantly declined since the feds started managing the species. And this is just a great example that shows that conservation efforts are more successful when they, when they are voluntarily um, uh, and are supported locally. So I'll end that by saying I certainly trust the farmers and ranchers um, who want to be good stewards of our land um, in our local communities far more than the federal government. And I thank you all for your wisdom here today. I, I think you're gonna give us a lot of content that we can use here in DC. Thank you, Ms. Bilbert. Uh, appreciate that. Now I'm gonna turn to the gentleman from California, Mr. Baladeo. Thank you. So listening to your testimony, I mean, you guys hit a, a lot on the solutions that need to be provided, and I really appreciate that. Uh, and I'm glad to be here part of this important discussion. Um, I mean, obviously, the Endangered Species Act was originally designed to be something that's supposed to help us, but that 3% uh, success rate is obviously, I mean, even by government standards, uh, pretty big failure. Um, and as a dairy farmer, obviously, playing a role in what we do, uh, farming, um, Agriculture is something that's so important to us, making sure that we take care of the land, take, take care of the animals, uh, the pesticides that we use, the different types of chemicals that we're allowed to use, uh, even the process. I mean, for myself to go and get my, um, my license, I have to go get my license so that I can hire a PCA who is also licensed to hire uh, an applicator who is also licensed to apply any products. And these products are so expensive that I mean, the implication that when people imply that we somehow use these products in a wasteful manner, is I mean, just idiotic because the, the goal of every farmer is to do everything as efficiently as possible 
markets don't give us the, the luxury of being wasteful with any product, uh, much less the very expensive ones that we're highly regulated on. Um, but in California, the Endangered Species Act has done something that hasn't affected as many as, as much as it's affected us. The water situation for us in the Central Valley and the Delta situation has just been an absolute disaster for us. Uh, we continue to see species uh, decimated and solutions have been proposed, uh, but we continue down the same path because, again, leadership, mainly on the other side of the aisle, has opposed us on every level. And I, I wanted to ask more questions, but you guys kind of went through everything and, and answered, and we just need some common sense. Hopefully that's what we need. And, and local control is always something that uh, we push for at the federal level. My fear is, uh, obviously I live in California, local control uh, at the state level is something that I'm even more terrified of because the state's done an even worse job uh, than, uh, than the federal government. But if we can get it down to even the local level, our counties can play an absolute role, water districts play a role. I think that would be very, very helpful. And I've seen everything from farmers being sued uh, by government agencies in the northern part of California uh, to the situation where we desperately need help on is on the waterfront. And so I appreciate Western Caucus putting this together, having the opportunity to talk. I wish I had some questions for you, but you literally answered all of them for me. Um, I mean, you guys proposed solutions. You talked about some of the issues that we're dealing with. Uh, but ultimately, we need to get us in a position where we get some common sense uh, passed and uh, allowing some of our agencies to be successful instead of continuing to fail and rewarding failure by giving them more money and more power and just getting uh, our country in a situation where we fall behind production-wise. And, uh, and sadly, uh, until we uh, change the rules here in, at the federal level, I think we're gonna continue down this path. So thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, Chairman, for allowing us the opportunity and I uh, wish I could have had some questions for you, but thanks for all the information you provided. That's what happens when we have very well qualified panelists, right? <laughs> so, um, thank you, Mr. Valadeo. Mr. Palmer from the great state of Alabama, I'll turn the floor to you for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, particularly happy to see Jonathan Wood here, uh, uh, having worked with Jane Shaw and the Ditch Group for uh, many years now. I was running the think tank uh, and visiting her. Uh, I joke that I bought a coat and both of them run down. Montana uh, during the three days they had summer. <laughs> so, uh, I do have a couple of questions. One, it's interesting to me how the left has, has gone all in on the endangered species and it's and all of you can respond to this. And uh, what they're doing though in regard to renewal projects, in particular the uh, lesser sage grouse and, and, uh, and some of these other species that they're going to have to impact their uh, habitat in order to basically build out a new power grid. And I literally asked uh, this question in one of, I can't remember if it was uh, an Energy and Commerce Committee hearing or the uh, Select Committee on the Climate Crisis, uh, um, what, what they were doing that regard and, and, uh, and they would go forward with the project. Um, have, have any of you looked at, at uh, how the Endangered Species Act might be handled as these groups push more and more for building uh, out a renewable power system. I'm happy to, to start that conversation. Um, one of the things that PERC has looked at is whether that's an opportunity to expand more markets in the way that we manage endangered species. We had a fellow producer report recently on, um, so for wind energy, for instance, the big concern is eagle death. Right. Um, and right now, the, there are no incentives to reduce uh, deaths. If you have a permit, it says you can take a certain number of eagles, and that's how many you can take. Uh, and we propose using markets to actually reduce that, to encourage people where they site wind energy facilities, how they're run, to try to reduce those impacts to the environment. And there's no reason why that approach should be limited to wind energy. Every industry that's impacting species should be giving, given incentives to reduce impacts and ultimately to produce positive benefits. That if you're Conserving rangelands that are important to species or doing other things to the species, you should benefit from that activity, not be punished for it. I also understand that, uh, and I think this is correct, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, the California Condor, they've lost some of theirs to uh, turbines in, in California. And if, um, if that type of accident occurred on your farm, which it wouldn't in Tennessee, 
about it. But if you were a California farmer, as David is, and that would occur, keep you in jail. Uh, the other thing that I, I find interesting in regard to the Black's position on endangered species is water policy. And water policies that we see implemented in California, I think, have uh, a particularly negative impact on certain species. While they're protecting certain aquatic species, there are other species that I think are going to be harmed, severely harmed, by California's water policies. And uh, uh, if any of you uh, have a, a response to that, I'd like to hear it, including David. I'd question if they're actually helping any species at this point. And that's one of the things is they're claiming to help, but I don't think there's any, been any improvement other than uh, farm raised species have been in, uh, introduced into the Delta. Well, I'm, I'm, and I see Commissioner Prince is about to respond. I think that the water policies, uh, and with what's happening right now with the drought in California, by the way, it's not the most severe drought in the history of California, but it had far more se severe droughts uh, in the last thousand years. That um, uh, what has happened in, in California over the years with uh, the water policies previous to the left taking control and the amount of agrarian uh, agricultural activity that's taking place out there actually benefited species. But with the water policies and what's happening with farmland out there now, I think, have a negative impact. Good response. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, in, in, I'm from Nevada. The to the, just barely to the east of California. Uh, obviously, we're having the same, experiencing the same drought cycle that California is. <clears throat> they, with regard to the Endangered Species Act and some of the aquatic species that are found in the Colorado River system is now having an impact not only on storage at Lake Mead and Lake Mojave, but it's also having, a sort of, uh, 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 having an impact on policy from our Division of Water Resources and our state water engineer in terms of water rights in, even into the central portion of the state and, and moving water out of uh, the central portion of the state. Uh, it'll, it is, it's estimated right now that, that endangered species threats to critical habitat in the Colorado River is gonna have more to do with uh, uh, shortages of water in the, in the Colorado River system in the near future than the water itself. Um, the other thing I would like to point out is that according to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the number one impact on greater sage grouse uh, habitat is wildfire. It's wild, you know, wildfire and, and uh, the uh, noxious weed infestations that, that replace the native vegetation following those wildfires. And water policy is having a significant impact on, on the ability to uh, uh, pre-treat much of the, the of fire prone areas and to also fire fight those those areas when they are on fire so I just wanted to, to state that for the record. Mr. Chairman this is the, the I guess the, I should have stated the direction I'm trying to go with this is that there is this um, um, hypocrisy that exists on, on the left that uh, they will interfere with, with the private enterprise uh, with ag agriculture and others in, in the name of, of preserving the endangered species. But as Commissioner French just pointed out, this uh, uh, floors management policy and, and, the, and the lack of it uh, and, and the uh, forest fires that you're experiencing out west has, has, has destroyed habitat for a number of endangered species. The water policy is impacting them. And we think of, of the flying uh, of, of birds and, and, and uh, animals on ground, but it's also impacting uh, on the insect side, particularly like butterflies and bees and things like that. And, and we're really not holding them accountable for this. And I think this is part of what we need to do going forward is, is point out how their policies are extremely destructive uh, on the endangered species side. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thanks, I think we'll do that. Sure, Mr. Dale. So those forest fires, the one thing that I think shocks a lot of people is obviously it has an impact. I live in the in the valley, um, and we have a megawatt of solar on our farm. When those fires are raging, the sky is so dark and dirty. I mean, it's obviously bad for our, our health. Mm -hmm. You've got ashes on your vehicle when you wake up in the morning, but your solar production just tanks. And so it puts us in even bigger bind with our energy side. 
because we're starting to rely more and more on the solar as the pollution continues to to create this havoc. But it hurts us on every different front: healthcare costs, energy costs, um, and then obviously all the ground we've made uh, improving vehicles over the years to better or less polluting vehicles. And it's just it's an absolute headache. I have one more comment. Obviously, as members of Congress, we can't ask any independent um, group to do anything. We can't request you to do anything. But I haven't found anything along the lines of what I just laid out. Uh, and if there's some research out there that you know of that will expose the, the dangers uh, of the problems that have been created for endangered species because of, of these misguided policies, water policy, uh, uh, forest management policies, I think that would be extremely helpful, and, and we would love to see it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Palmer and Mr. Valadeo. We always bring important points up, so appreciate that. Um, I'd like to turn the floor to Mr. Tiffany from Wisconsin. Tom, you got five minutes. Thank you very much. And uh, Montana is lucky to have three days of summer. You come to northern Wisconsin, you have another one. <laughs> <laughs> At least by Alabama standards. Um, so I refer to the ESA as the Hotel California. You can enter it, but you will never leave. And I think the greatest example is the wolf. And between the radical, you know, the, the, the corporate environmental groups which you guys are so familiar with, as well as the courts, they really have turned the ESA into the Hotel California. And uh, they just don't allow them to leave. Um, Ms. Bobert did a real good job of talking about uh, uh, the timber wolf, gray wolf, whatever you want to call it. And uh, we have put together a couple bills. Uh, in, we also put together a letter to the current uh, secretary, um, to uh, the Secretary of Interior, Holland, asking her to fight the decision of the courts to um, or to appeal that decision and um, obviously she's not going to do that and uh, we also have introduced recently the trust the science act and I have this uh, right here um, so the wolf in Wisconsin is delisted about 10 years ago I think it was 12 or 13 12, 12 2013 delisted again via executive authority by the Trump administration and um, um, after the 2012 um, delisting, and we had a successful wolf on that in like three years, and then it got relisted. These 26 wildlife scientists signed a letter to the Department of Interior, the Fish and Wildlife, saying that you should delist the wolf. You should delist the wolf because you're going to ultimately jeopardize the Endangered Species Act, where people will not have respect for it if you have a species that recovers and that's really the one thing that I don't think has been considered with the Endangered Species Act, and perhaps how it should be amended, is that um, when you have a species that's recovered, um, like the wolf has, um, it should be allowed to be taken off the list, but there's so much pressure from the special interest groups, especially the radical green groups, to keep that on there. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar, they, the fundraising appeals go out immediately um, if the wolf is delisted. I remember when I was in the state legislature, there was no other issue, none, that would generate more email contact than we, when we talked about the wolf. It's just amazing uh, how hypersensitive it is. But anyhow, these 26 wildlife scientists, many of them who do not agree with me on particular wildlife management issues, they sent this letter saying that the wolf should be delisted and um, otherwise you're going to jeopardize the Endangered Species Act. So now with that, um, uh, I guess I address this to Mr. French, but anybody else wants to comment on it. Um, uh, do the feds, do the federal, does the federal government coordinate with you? For example, the Federal Land Policy Management Act specifically says in it that they're required to coordinate. Do they do that? Uh, selectively. Um, we had, I have examples where they have as a county commissioner I also have them as a wildlife biologist working for the state of Nevada. I also had examples where they did not. A uh, good example of the did not side of it had to do with the greater sage grouse. Um, as you're probably aware, the, the main data for sage grouse populations, habitat needs, and distribution for the state of Nevada at least 
was found in the 50 years of data that was collected by the Department of Wildlife. No contacts were made to the Department of Wildlife before the uh, warranted but precluded listing was, uh, was announced. Uh, that was probably as, as big a faux pas as I've seen in my career. Um, with regard to uh, the uh, LUPA, the Land Use Plan Amendment that was proposed um, following the interim management guidelines for sage grouse, uh, the state of Nevada, particularly the Nevada Association of Counties, filed suit against the federal government and won in federal court based on that, uh, their advocation of their responsibility under FLIPNA to consultate with, consultation with uh, state and local governments. And uh, um, the interesting part is right now with the change of administration today, um, they have adopted the 2015 plan as it was before that was actually thrown out by the federal court. So we're kind of pending right there. Okay, it's something I really uh, emphasize and I would to um, all of us here also, is there is that requirement to coordinate and it isn't just to consult. It isn't just to be, um, well, consistency ends up in there, um, but they'll say, well, we're cons the federal government will say we're consulting and whatever. They have to coordinate and coordinate is a much different uh, uh, process where um, best described to me as um, uh, treating everyone at the table as an equal. In other words, the county, the state, they come as equals to the table and states and counties can demand that. Could I ask one other question real quickly, Mr. Attorney? Oh, absolutely, please. Okay, um, uh, any of you, um, any particular changes that you want to see to the Endangered Species Act? Is there something you've seen in there? Is there something that you would really like to see? Or like, this is one of the things that needs to change? Congressman, I, the thing that I, from my experience uh, in Montana with the sage grouse in particular is uh, just how effective getting stakeholders involved, you know? And, I, and the way the ESA is written is it's kind of it's, it's a top-down approach and uh, it doesn't recognize that there's diverse ecosystems from one state or to the next for example Montana certainly is the same as Alabama or Mississippi or whatever in terms of ecosystem and I and I really think that it um, discounts local community uh, willingness to help solve these problems um, I want to give you one example and that's a uh, it involves one of our electric cooperatives, the Fall River Electric, which serves around around and adjacent to Yellowstone National Park. Sir, may I interrupt, please? Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, I apologize. I have to go and introduce an amendment. I messed up in judiciary. No, okay. But please continue with your answer, if you would. Okay. Thank so, you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Becker. Yeah, so this, uh, thank you. Uh, so this, uh, Co-op uh, Fall River Electric. So there's a, in in the service area that they have, um, there's a habitat, a slough that um, uh, provides a habitat for about 1,000 trumpeter swans, mm -hmm. and um, the so it's a slough that uh, it easily becomes foggy at certain times. So what was happening was, is there a number of there was a power line there that the co-op owned and a number of trumpeter swans were uh, colliding with this power line and due, due primarily to the fog. And so in fact, in one year, there was 12 trumpeter swans that collided with it and were killed. And so um, the local folks uh, contacted the co-op and said, you know, what can we do about this? Because that power line is, you know, is really causing a problem. And they, you know, tried some measures of, you know, putting visible uh, devices on there to try to make it more visible, but the fog just, Directed that so uh, made it impossible still for the swans to see it. So um, the co-op got together with the community and said, and, and they just worked together to say, let's let's raise some money to bury these this power line. Uh, it was cost I think about 115 thousand. This is back in 2015, and so um, the community really came together and uh, donated money, and the co-op of course donated some of its funds as well as its labor to. Uh, bury this power line and, and fix this problem. So I just say that because uh, it's that local, that, those, that community concern, I think if you, and we saw that with the sage grouse, so we just got all the stakeholders in one room, the governor said, all right, you guys, you gotta fix this. You gotta figure out a way to keep this bird from being listed. 
and they did. We worked out with conservationists and all industry people, and uh, we got a great program going. So yeah, that local community uh, involvement is very important. Mr. French has. If, if I could one more sure. comment, uh, having to do with what, what would I do to change ESA if I had an opportunity. Um, first, um, requiring the federal agencies, um, in, particular, in particular the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, to establish cooperating agency status for all the state and local entities which are affected uh, during the, the, the process of determination. Uh, that would allow for introduction of um, uh, specific uh, wildlife data, uh, interaction data, as well as socioeconomic um, indicate, uh, data uh, that the communities may offer. Uh, and secondly, cooperation between federal agencies and programs within that context of that would be important. One real quick example, uh, I also sit on the National Wild Horse and Borough Advisory Board. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, we find ourselves many times, as you're well aware, wild horse numbers are in some cases four to five times over uh, allowable management levels that were established uh, in the Act. Uh, and because of those animals are there year round, uh, they, the impacts on critical wildlife habitat for ESA uh, that are covered under ESA um, is um, uh, a very common problem, at least in Nevada. Uh, especially for some of the aquatic species that are covered. So uh, requiring those agencies to actually manage to federal standards that are actually la listed in the law would, would, would be very helpful. Hmm. Very good. Um, I've got a couple of questions of my own. I, mean, I know we have uh, at least one more member, maybe a couple more coming, but uh, let me start with uh, my farmer friend from Tennessee. Uh, Mr. Meadows, I, I'm from, gathering from your testimony, you're familiar with the top-down approach that federal regulations have. Um, as someone that's a farmer that tries to live under these regulations and, and knows the impacts of them, could you talk a little bit, maybe from your perspective, um, ways that uh, agencies could make regulations more workable and maybe more effective for people that are trying to implement and live under them? Absolutely. Uh, so, I mean, I would echo a little bit of what was said as far as uh, consulting stakeholders it would be a, a big benefit on the front end, you know, making sure that we get something that is that is workable, that is flexible, uh, that we can, you know, operate under. And uh, as I mentioned uh, in my opening remarks, uh, you know, better data, <laughs> better data, better maps, uh, data that is real, uh, real world stuff that is not, um, you know, so many times like in, in the in the glyphosate assessment there, it, it, it assumes maximum use rate. I can tell you that I have never used a maximum use rate of glyphosate in a, in a season. You know, I mean, I'm typically uh, probably less than a third. Hmm. So when you look at that, you know, that, that brings in all kind of implications as far as what it can mean to certain species, but don't, that's not real world data, so to speak. Uh, so, you know, just better data, better maps. Um, the map issue is what caused a lot of the uh, issues this year uh, with the 2,4-D herbicide. Um, you know, certain counties were identified as having the American bearing beetle uh, that have never had them. Uh, and, uh, you know, and if in some counties that were, you know, a very large county, they might be in one small area, nowhere remotely close to agriculture, but yet it affected the whole ag population. Uh, you know, people had seed, chemicals, everything there, ready to use, ready to go for the year, you know, because we were all told, get your stuff way ahead of time, stuff is tight, you know, uh, pesticides are tight and uh, you know, seed is tied, everything was short, so get your stuff ahead of time. Everybody had all their their, their input bought, and then that come out and it, it caused quite the, the tailspin there for a little while. Good ideas, yeah, thank you. Uh, um, uh, Mr. Bax, you, you've worked on these issues for a long time, judging from your, your resume in, in a couple different capacities. Um, I think you've tracked uh, changes in regulation, particularly uh, in, uh, from the Trump administration to now the Biden administration. 
Could you tell us what you think are maybe some of the most consequential changes that have been made? And conversely, where should we as members of Congress direct um, our immediate focus for positive change? Thanks for the question. Um, I'll start with the kind of PSA focus, focus today. Um, I, you know, one of the comments I made in the testimony was really a lot, some of the changes that you'd make to the statute really are just clarifying the statute. It's not even that the PSA statute, the language itself is problematic, it's that the federal government has misapplied the law. This gets into the threat and endangered distinction that we talked about. This gets into the fact that the government will not be transparent when it comes to providing economic data and relevant data during the listing decision, which they certainly can do, which is what the EPA does, in fact, do. If you can make a decision as relates to air quality without necessarily considering the economic uh, information, but what it does by having that economic information in the data is allow people to understand the implications of what the agency is doing. So the, the government, the Biden administration has definitely tried to get rid of some of the ESA rules. They've done, uh, we've talked about water policy before. Um, it's unfortunate that they moved away from the Trump administration's WOTUS uh, definition. And fortunately, the Supreme Court will provide some clarity on what water United States means in the fall in the Sackett case. So that might help matters. But in the meantime, farmers and others are dealing with a situation where it's very complicated as to what waters are even regulated under waters in the United States, and even what regulatory framework even applies. I think it would be valuable, would be for some clarity, at least in the interim, for property owners to know what regulatory framework even to comply with it in the meantime. I, I know that one of the um, key pillars is scientific kind of integrity of science with the ESA, and certainly that's critical. Um, and what I see is the left often criticizes conservatives for not respecting the science when in fact it's the exact opposite. Um, I know that many people on the, on the Hill and conservatives have been pushing for sound science for a long time. The Trump administration did as well. I think it's critical that the public have access to underlying data and models that inform the decisions that federal agencies are making so that we can evaluate how the agencies themselves are implement, implementing policies that have a huge impact on all of our lives and across the economy. And I would point out something I know that's kind of not connected to the ESA, but that the EPA has taken some actions over the last couple of years, which I think are very discouraging, where they got rid of the entire um, Case Act and the Science Advisory Board, just did a full sweep of getting rid of every single member to try to appoint people that are kind of in line, I would say, with the beliefs and maybe the potentially, in, in, you know, uh, in, in line more of the beliefs of the administration. That, to me, is kind of a clear evidence of not trying to respect scientific integrity, but undermining scientific integrity. So I continue to encourage policymakers to push the scientific integrity um, angle and trying to promote and transparency and scientific integrity really do kind of play into each other. Um, by better transparency, better peer review, um, we can actually have better science. Good, thanks. Mr. Chairman, can I echo just briefly? One sure, point? Mr. Reeves. Yeah, so um, on the science part, I absolutely agree with Mr. Bass. And I think we saw on, on July 13th, NOAA came out with that report on the Lower Snake River dams. And it acknowledged that they didn't even really have the science uh, that didn't entirely back them up. But they just said, well, it's worth trying anyway to get rid of those dams, even though they did not, in that NOAA report, it's supposed to be a professional scientific report, acknowledge that and just didn't care. So it had you know, gaping holes in the science and that, that's just not acceptable. Well, thank you for that. Um, and I was going to ask you anyway, since you brought up the dams, um, you, know, that you know that those dams, at least at this point, two of them are in my district. Um, they won't be next year, but that's the impacts uh, that we, the benefits that we receive from the dams definitely are in my district. 
Um, I don't have to tell you, but I don't mind saying that these dams are critically important for agriculture, for transportation, for the clean energy production that you mentioned, for, for recreational tourism in, uh, industries, and so many impacts positively to our culture and our economy. And as you know, that there's a, a, the, the voices to tear the dams down are louder than ever. Um, could you talk a little bit, maybe from your perspective, about the, the, those misconceptions that we're hearing about mm -hmm. the, uh, the dams versus the salmon, and maybe <coughs> maybe some of the real things that we could do to address the, the challenges to fish survival? Right. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, now, uh, you look at that. Look at the studies that are coming out, including the uh, BPA's Biden, BPA Biden administration study that came out, I think, on the same day as that Miller report, and they they cite that it's cl clearly it's climate change that is causing the problems with salmon, and uh, of course there's a sub factors of the ocean conditions and the harvest and predation that, that you know, are are existing there as as key causes, but. Um, you know, other studies have shown that if you go, you look up and down the Pacific coast where you have free flowing rivers and rivers that are dams, they're all facing those challenges with salmon returns. Uh, the Fraser River in British Columbia is free flowing river and it's got problems with salmon. Um, and then, you know, the, the solutions are to uh, continue to um, Im improve the, uh, you know, you know bigger culverts that are better located and things like that, just to name one example of things you can do. There's more things that can be done, but uh, it's just absolutely absurd to, to, you know, if we're concerned about climate change, and we've got, but we've got these pro-breaching folks who are say, saying, well, okay, well, the solution here to the problem of the salmon is to make the problem worse by getting rid of the dams, you know, the carbon thing, the, the whole issue of that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's, you know, it's hydropower isn't the problem. We, uh, a report just came out, um, I think it was last week, that showed that the salmon numbers on the Lower Snake River dams continue to improve. That trend is continuing. Mm -hmm. So it, it's demonstrating that they can, hydropower and the salmon can coexist. Yeah, that, absolutely. I was going to make that point too. The, the record numbers of re, returning fish this year uh, yeah. just prove that very fact that that they can and do coexist. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Wood, I was intrigued by a, a, a thought that you brought up in your testimony. That's, I can't recall exactly how you put it, but if you find a, a, a precious metal or some kind of valuable uh, mineral on, on your land, your land increases in value. If you find a, a threatened or endangered species, look out. You're, uh, nobody wants to find that because you're penalized. So uh, you, you talked about the need to change the incentives of the ASA uh, transition back to a recovery focused market. And you touched on this a little bit, but could you help us envision how, how, what would this look like? How, how do we incentivize uh, people instead of penalize and so that they become partners in recovering species? Yeah, um, I, I appreciate the question, and it, it's such a big question that I will try to um, answer it coherently, but the answer is likely going to depend on the species and the challenges that landowners face. But uh, one of the areas where PERC works really hard with our on-the-ground conservation work is going to landowners and understanding what the challenges they face and figuring out a way to solve a challenge while also producing a conservation benefit. And that's really the perspective the Fish and Wildlife Service and conservation groups should bring to endangered species issues. Generally, the reason why an endangered threatened species is around today is because some landowner in the past conserved that habitat or took other steps to make sure mm. uh, that that species could be around. And we should be looking to reward them and helping them continue to do the work that they're doing. Too often, we pun punish that person um, and, in, in effect, make species a liability. Mm. Mr. Paul. Are you suggesting um, a government program like the CRP program, things like that, where we actually pay our people to to uh, let cropland fly fallow or plant certain grasses or trees? Uh, that that would make more sense than basically making the land of no value at all. That certainly would make 
more sense. I'm glad you, you made that point that if we paid landowners for producing species producing habitat, we'd get better outcomes in penalizing them. But ultimately, um, that, that model may not be sustainable without private industry and private conservation groups also having skin in the game. That groups that are concerned about the wolf and the eagle and all the other species need to recognize that they need to be a part of the solution, not, not someone focused on litigation or creating conflict. And until we get the ESA incentives right, we're going to continue hitting conservation groups against landowners rather than having them work together as partners. You know, this, they're not an endangered species, but I, I was the, the gentleman from Tennessee is here honoring Trayvon Horn, and um, we're overrun with deer. I mean, they're becoming a hazard in the suburbs, uh, on a coyote staying away. And uh, part of it is because we have not managed, um, not, not just habitat, but, but animal populations in a way, um, for instance, Most of these animals have lost their fear of humans and have very few predators. And uh, I don't know how this fits into all this, but in, in regard to the wolf, uh, we do need those populations up, but we don't need them up to the point where they become uh, a problem in suburban areas. I, I just saw in California where uh, mountain lions have, have literally come down to the backyard. Uh, you know, little muffies that you get off, it's not safe anymore. But, uh, mountain lions and I know this things between a, a 15 pound dog and a 25 pound child. Uh, it's not just in California, it's in Washington yeah. too, we're seeing that. And we're, and my wife called me uh, and, uh, upset because she thought there was uh, an ambulance at Taylor Cooper's yard. There were four coyotes uh, lying right at the edge of the yard. There are a lot of ways to look at this. But my biggest, uh, my biggest point in all this is that um, the, the things that we'll get sued over if you're trying to build a road or a bridge. Apparently, the left has decided it's okay if you're trying to put in a solar system or a hmm. turbine system. Could I add something? Sure, Mr. Madison. Yeah, I appreciate that point. It's interesting. It reminds me of. You start to appreciate NEPA and the permitting obstacles, appreciate the ESA and the obstacles, and then what, what happens is they'll just create carve-outs for it. So it's basically, it's relevant when it's, those requirements are relevant when it suits them. And then, of course, when something actually has to be done, um, it's okay to kind of, those costs that otherwise would exist in other projects, they can be incurred in those situations because those aren't the projects that they care about. Um, and I think one of the problems, just in the ESA and just generally with, I would say the left on the environmental side, is there's just kind of a failure to recognize the trade-offs that exist. Um, we see this obviously in the energy space, where we push certain types of energy policies, or the Biden administration certain energy policies without recognizing all the incredible harm that it also causes. And there's always going to be trade-offs, and the same thing as relates to the ESA, it's important because one of the key pillars here is flexibility. By giving flexibility to the states and others, you allow them to kind of recognize that decisions, that there are these trade-offs, that decisions are not being made in a vacuum, that, that one, an impact on one species could have detrimental impacts on another species. And then finally, if I could, you brought up the CRP, these kind of federal um, conservation programs. And one of the problems is that it's, so general, and uh, first of all, the CRP, a lot of the land is not even environmentally sensitive. So you kind of have land idle that doesn't really need to be idle, but not to kind of pick on the CRP program, but I think Jonathan got to this. this um, but I think the key is to have specific goals and outcomes, and then have kind of measuring sticks along the way, but allow the people closest to the problems to actually be the ones trying to figure out how to solve the problem and how to achieve the outcomes. And if that means that it's, it might, the best solution might be for a state to pay crop owners, that may be, so be it. But at least they're figuring out different ways to kind of solve these specific 
problems. And as a result of having the different states and regions working together, you have a laboratory of democracy and we can see what the best practices are. Instead, we're kind of prevented from seeing that because of this heavy-handed approach from the federal government. Yeah. And my last point on that in regard to uh, the conservation of, of species is uh, in the 1940s and 50s, there was very few deer, very few birds in Alabama. And, and uh, it was a private effort with um, a, a public-private effort that had restored uh, wild turkey and deer. Same thing happened with uh, waterfowl. And, uh, but there appears to be no sensible effort to do some of the things you're talking about in a, a public-private partnership uh, uh, to, to maintain uh, some of the species that they're concerned about uh, with some of the endangered species list. Mr. Chairman Collins. Mr. Williams, yes. Mr. Mayor, on the whole idea of incentivizing. Totally agree. And and speaking to your point, Mr. Chairman, about flexibility, importance of that. So with the hate to keep bringing up the sage grouse, but it is our, our experience that we've had a lot of in Montana. So when we first started this process, you know, they said uh, the folk the conservation folks said, well we want you to want you to vary those power lines. And uh, we said, well first of all, uh, you know these power lines cost five times five times more to bury a power line than to have an overhead, so that's very expensive. Uh, then plus you've got this mitigation cost that you've, uh, you've proposed that are treating our, these uh, underground lines when we put them in like they're overhead lines. So they're you know, the same widths, all you know, thousands of, or hundreds of thousands of acres more potentially, and uh, mitigation costs. And we said, you need to look at what a, you know, this trenchless excavation does. It, how the minimal impact it actually has. So we actually uh, showed them pictures of what these trenchless excavators look like, and they they only you know about this wide impact, and they just they just slice the the power line immediately right into the land, and it just heals right up and and right away. And so thankfully, you know, but this is at the state level, uh, they listened to us and and agreed, and and so they accommodated and were flexible, and and so it drastically reduced those um, uh, mitigation costs and incentivize our co-ops to start burying those, plus give us credit for, for doing that. So good, we use good. Um, we're almost out of time, but I got, wanted one more question for Commissioner French. Um, you were a state biologist for a long time in Nevada. Like, could you help us understand uh, some of the work that you did at the state and local level protecting threatened and endangered species, and why a federal listing uh, could be detrimental to, to that kind of work and may, and, and may um, impede that kind of work from happening. If I had to sum that up in one, one sentence, it'd be control. Um, that the agency that's closest to that resource is the one that understands how it needs its, its specific needs and its and the biology behind uh, that and the justification for management. Uh, when a, a listing occurs, um, the control, the state control, the local go government control is lost. And uh, especially once there is a determination for critical habitat, um, the federal government comes in and the, pretty much that, that collaboration no longer exists. Um, the other, on the, the other side of it is that um, the state agencies uh, have a history of because of where they live, they work very close to the to the ranching, farming, or outdoor recreation groups, the NGOs that are involved in their in their area of responsibility. And when it when the bell rings and it's decide, it's time to do something positive for a species such as sage grouse or Lahontan cutthroat trout or something along that line. It allows that state agency is, is, is best suited and best positioned to actually head off the head up those those uh, recovery activities. Uh, in the cases where they've been allowed to do that, it's been a, I, I think has been a, uh, a success, and that's the reason I I uh, spoke of both uh, the LCT as well as the uh, sage grouse, um, and I think. The, the federal government, um, if 
you know, we had quite a conversation here about the the stick and the and the uh, and the, you know the, the ability to and the carrot, so to speak, and the, and the ability for uh, to bring people closer to the process. And in within the case of the Lahontan Cutthroat Trout, we did exactly that. We were we actually had the, the ranching community, the farming community. The NGOs were sitting in the room, cooperating agency status, and we actually developed workable management. But the biggest part of that was that we actually we actually encompassed a set of goals. In other words, we, a, a farmer or a rancher that might have a long cutthroat stream going through his property knew that if we could we could make these specific changes on their habitat, and it produced four. Uh, age classes of young fish over over a period of time that we could we would petition to delist that species on that on, on that segment of the population and so they had this tangible the, a tangible reward for doing the right thing and there was a and within the community there was a lot of, of pride in being that, that Humboldt County wanted to be the first community in the, in the state of Nevada to petition for a delisting of Lahontan Cutthroat Trout. And so there, that, just from that standpoint alone, there was a lot of interest in, in working cooperatively with, with uh, the state. The flip side of that is that if, if you tell them you're going to do something and, you, and, they, and they are all in and you don't do it or you change your mind, you're done, you're finished, you're, you know, they'll never trust you again. And so that was that was the downside from you know from that you know, from yeah. a federal perspective. Good. Well, let me just say thank you very much to all of our panelists, uh, Jonathan Wood from Perk, uh, Commissioner Jim French from the Humboldt County, Nevada, uh, Gary Weens from Montana Electric Cooperative Association, Mr. Darren Baxt, Baxt uh, from Heritage Foundation and. Mr. Alan Meadows from the American Soybean Association. Thank you all very much for being here and contributing to what I think is a very, very important conversation on an issue that affects everybody around the country. And I also want to thank uh, my Western Caucus colleagues for participating here, bringing up some very important questions and points, and uh, look forward very much to working with you, all of you, um, on both sides of the dais here as we work to bring about really important improvements to the ESA so that it works for everybody. Not, not just the human side of the species, but also uh, our wildlife and plant life as well. I think we can do a lot of good things. So thank you very much for participating and I look forward to continued work together. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.